me. Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, part 1, the introduction to prophecy. And the Lord willing, we'll be doing an overview next week. We may actually have to continue the introduction, but I think you'll find it interesting. I have three handouts for tonight that I hope will give a little clarity to where we are going with our study. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. God's word for his people. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct in all of these lessons, for you have given great promise of blessing to those who read and obey the book of Revelation. Help us to understand. Help us to perceive so that we might be obedient to you because the time is at hand. We thank you, Father, that you have opened the curtain of future history so that we might not only be prepared, but that so we might rejoice in times of difficulty, even in times of persecution, because we know the end from the beginning. You, the sovereign God of all of eternity, have revealed it. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on our study of this, your word, and that you fill our hearts with joy and gladness that we know the one who is the Word of God, the one who is called the Almighty. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some very important promises in verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And he said it again, for the time is at hand. First, as we begin our study, we need to lay down some ground rules. The first of those is, this week I'm hoping to give an introduction to prophecy to see how both the Old and the New Testaments give a substantial amount of space to the end times. Now, how many of you here don't have one of those papers for taking notes? Okay, there are papers for taking notes here. Let's see. Ed, would you pick up these papers here and pass them out to anybody who needs a paper for taking notes? Because we have some very basic things that we need to set down as the ground rules today, and you can just hand those out to the people who need them. The Old Testament contains a very 
large amount, as you know, of prophecy concerning the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are over 300 prophecies that deal with his first coming. And all of those were literally and precisely and exactly fulfilled. That's very important because if the first coming prophecies were literally fulfilled, we would expect the prophecies concerning his return also to be literally fulfilled. There are folks out there, and they are, some of them, real believers, who think that the first coming prophecies were fulfilled literally, but that when it comes to the things about the return of Christ, well, we can't actually take those literally. We sort of have to allegorize them or spiritualize them away. That's a form of theology that goes back to a Roman Catholic theologian of many years ago. And he said, well, you know, we know the Bible is true, but we don't understand some of that, so it must not be literal. We do not want to follow that line of reasoning. We believe that every word is inspired and God wanted to communicate with us so that we would understand the truth. All previous prophecy that has been fulfilled was fulfilled literally, not only concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, but concerning all of those things that happened in the Old Testament that were prophesied concerning the Assyrian captivity, concerning the Babylonian captivity, concerning the rise of the thir first three great empires in the book of Daniel, very clearly stated, which we'll get into tonight because there's a fourth empire that has not yet risen that is prophesied in the end. All of that has been fulfilled exactly and literally just like it's said in the Bible. And so we anticipate that all other prophecies those still yet future will be fulfilled in exactly the same way because God is a God of order and not a God of confusion. So that's first principle, number one. Number two, the second thing that we need to realize is that the New Testament not only restates and clarifies many of the Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, but it also gives new information not revealed in the Old Testament concerning the return of Christ. Did you know the Old Testament is full of second coming prophecy? But there are some prophecies about the return of Christ that are not found in the Old Testament. Those are the prophecies that specifically deal with the rapture of the church. The rapture is listed as one of the 17 mysteries that are given to us in the New Testament. The word musterion, the word that's translated mystery, does not mean some kind of a detective story. That word means something that was not revealed before, but now is revealed. Prior to the first coming of Christ, there were things about his second coming that were not told to the Old Testament saints. They did not see coming a rapture for the church because the church was one of the mysteries of the Old Testament. God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament. We find on the day of Pentecost something new transpires. God establishes the church. It's a body that as it moves through the book of Acts we discover includes Jewish men and then we find those who are half Jewish and half Gentile, both men and women, and then those who are 100% men, women, and children by the time we get over to Acts 10. And in the middle of that, at the end of Acts chapter 8, we have a person who's neither male nor female. He's a eunuch. And all of them are brought into the body of Christ. We've gone through the book of Acts and talked about that in detail. So the things that are revealed in the New Testament that relate specifically to the church are new revelation, and they are called by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, mysteries. That's new revelation, not revealed in the Old Testament, but now revealed in the New Testament. Let me read that passage to you. This is a very important passage. It helps you understand many things in the New Testament that are called mysteries. Ephesians chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, now remember in the Old Testament, the Gentiles didn't have any promises. 
well, there were a few promises to certain Gentile nations, but, but for the most part, the Gentiles were outside the covenants and promises of God. So he's writing to Gentiles at Ephesus. The prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation, now listen carefully, how that by revelation, so we're getting new revelation at this point, he made known unto me the mystery. There's our key word. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when I read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now here's your definition, verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now he's talking about one mystery in particular here, the mystery of Christ, so that's what he describes in verse 6, but he gives you the definition of a mystery in verse 5. Verse 6, the mystery of Christ is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And that's defined for us in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. That gives you the key elements of the gospel, who Jesus is and what he did. Jesus is both God and man, and he died for our sins and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. Those are the key elements of the gospel. You leave any of that out and you do not have a Christ who can save. If you have a Christ who died but didn't rise from the dead, he can't save you. If you have a Christ who died and then only had a spiritual re resurrection, like some kind of a Gnostic resurrection, he can't save you. If he's not both God and man, if he's only an angelic being like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, they teach that he's Michael the Archangel. If he's only an angel, he can't save you because he can't give you an infinite eternal salvation, for he himself would be only a creature. He must be both God and man, one person, two natures. He must have died for your sins according to the scriptures, and he buried, proving he's dead, and he must rise from the dead according to the scriptures. Not some kind of a fake resurrection, not some kind of a swooning, not some kind of a hoax. It has to be a genuine resurrection if he's going to save you. And so that's what Paul says, the mystery of Christ now applies to us as Gentiles as well as those who had the promise to Abraham, for example, over in Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 16, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, multiple places which talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, second thing that we need to know is the New Testament not only re reinstates, but it also clarifies Old Testament prophecies and gives new information not revealed in the Old Testament. And we've read that mystery definition in Ephesians chapter 3. I mentioned a moment ago the New Testament gives us 17 different mysteries. You might, if you want to have a fun time, take your concordance and look up the word mystery in the New Testament and see if you can figure out what the 17 mysteries are, the 17 specific things that were not revealed in the Old Testament but now are revealed. Each one of them is designated by the term mystery. So you can look it up. It's a great study for you to do on your own. We're not going to go through all of them. But one of the mysteries is the rapture, which we'll be discussing in the course of this series. Point number three. <clears throat> we need to understand that all of the symbols used in the book of Revelation are used elsewhere in Scripture. So if we want to correctly interpret the symbols of Revelation, we need to look back at the other prophetic passages in the Bible where the symbols are used and explained. A number of years ago, and all of you will know who this is, on the radio there was a radio broadcaster who owned quite a number of radio stations, and he liked to allegorize the book of Revelation. He didn't think that anything there was literal, although he tried to give dates for things happening. And so uh, when he says, uh, I heard him once, uh, he said, uh, you know, it says a third of the ships in the sea will be destroyed. And uh, he says, well, what that means is ships are a picture of carrying the gospel message to foreign lands. So a third of the gospel testimony will be destroyed. Now, that has nothing to do with what's going on in the book of Revelation. It's not a third of the gospel testimony being destroyed. You know, and Satan sweeping a third of the stars from heaven is not 
with his tail. That's not the gospel being destroyed. You can't make it up as you go along. We'll discover that every one of the symbols that are used in the book of Revelation are power-packed because you find them in Ezekiel, you find them in Daniel, you find them in other parts of Revelation where they are defined for us. So we don't have to guess what the symbols mean. Writing in symbols does not mean writing in allegory. Writing in symbols gives you a visual presentation of what is actually going to be taking place in future history. That's number three. Number four. One of the basic hermeneutical principles of Bible exposition is to take the actual events literally, even though symbolic language may be used. Now, hermeneutics means principles of interpretation. There are different principles of interpretation so that you end up with the right thing. For example, you can never take a text out of context on a pretext. You can't just say, well, I've got this one verse here to prove something, but the context is saying the exact opposite. I mean, if that were the case, you could um, use 1 Peter, uh, where he is discussing the modest adornment of women, and you could use it to prove that we should all be nudists, because Peter says, let not your adorning be the putting on of apparel. Now, if you take that out of context, do not let your adorning be the putting out of apparel. Somebody could say, well, see, the Bible teaches nudism. It does not. That's a text taken out of context on a pretext. So we must always take things in their contexts. That's basic hermeneutics. Fifth, you cannot understand New Testament prophecy without having first obtained a good grasp on Old Testament prophecy which describes the same subject. There is a lot more prophecy in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament, simply because the Old Testament is a whole lot longer than the New Testament. And so as we go through the Old Testament, we will found, find the foundational prophecies for each of the specific prophecies that we look at in the book of Revelation. We'll also discover that some of the prophecies that are in the book of Revelation are described for us in more expanded detail, for example, in First and Second Thessalonians. Or in the book of Jude, there are some incredible prophecies in the book of Jude. As we look at those prophecies, we will have the underpinnings for understanding the prophecies that are in the book of Revelation. You've got to have a grasp on Old Testament prophecy. That was true concerning the prophecies about Christ's first coming. It's likewise true for the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ's second coming. Number six, it's important to understand that Israel and the church are not the same. Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. That's where a lot of covenant theology ends up going astray because it began to develop while Israel was out of the land and people like, for example, Martin Luther looked around and they didn't see Jews in the land. Uh, they saw all kinds of other things going on in the land of Israel, but the Jews weren't there. So they thought, well, I guess the church has taken over the, prophets, the promises that God gave to Israel because they rejected the Messiah. So therefore, now the church must be Israel. You see, that was Roman Catholic theology. Rome taught that Rome was the true Israel. And Luther looked at that and he said, well, definitely Rome is not the true Israel. Rome is the Babylonian harlot of the book of Revelation. So since it's not Rome, it must be us. We'll discover that you don't have to go to those kinds of conniptions and twists and contortions to understand prophecy. Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. One is a national physical entity tracing their physical ancestry back to Abraham. The other is a spiritual ent entity tracing their spiritual ancestry back to Abraham. God still has promises for national physical Israel, and it is a miracle that on May 14, 1948, God brought that nation into existence in a single day after they had been out of the land for 2,000 years. That has never, ever, ever in the history of the world occurred with another nation 
that has been out of their land for 2,000 years and suddenly reforms as a nation in one day and survives the attack of seven enemy nations that outnumbered them about 10 to 1 and Israel won. And the miracles that have happened in every war since then when the Arabs have tried to annihilate them. It was prophesied that they would be born in a day. Did it happen literally? It did. When Israel issued its declaration of independence, it was born in a day. David Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion. Some of you have seen some of the films that I've shown of him actually making that declaration of the statehood of Israel. The spiritual entity is the church tracing their spiritual ancestry back to Abraham because Abraham was of faith and we likewise enter into promises that God has made by faith. That will become more apparent the further we progress in our study. Number seven. Now we're not going to be able obviously to cover all of the Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ and by the way those fall into two different parts. Prophecies that are not revealed in the Old Testament like the rapture which uh, it's not revealed in the Old Testament, but it's clearly revealed in the New Testament, and the second coming of Christ, which is clearly revealed in the Old Testament. We can't cover everything, but I want to point you to a few very important key passages to read this week because we see them explained and fulfilled in the book of Revelation. Now, if one of you gentlemen would come up here so that nobody can say, I didn't write down all the passages that uh, I need to study, I'm giving you a handout here. I'm actually summarizing each of these passages for you so that you will be able to um, at least know what you're looking for as you read through them. A few key Old Testament prophecies to help understand the book of Revelation. Now, the whole book of Daniel has a lot of prophecy in it about the return of Christ. I'm just going to ask you this week to read. Please read. I'm going to ask next week who read the passages. This is not that much to read. You ought to be able to do this in a week. Daniel chapter 7 and 8. That's the vision of the four world empires, including the one ruled by the Antichrist, which has not yet appeared, but will be a revival of the Roman Empire with far more power than before. I'm going to give you some sample readings of these in just a second. Psalm chapter 2, it's very short. It's specifically quoted in the New Testament in reference to the second coming. Psalm 110. This is also specifically quoted in the New Testament in reference to the second coming and the defeat of the Antichrist. In fact, I wrote my baby thesis in seminary on Psalm 110. Before you could write a regular thesis, you had to write what they called the baby thesis to show that you could write and so that they could correct it so that when you wrote your real thesis, then uh, you would already know all the rules and what you're supposed to do and not waste their time. Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. That's a detailed description of the rebirth of Israel as a nation and of the battle of Gog and Magog. And we're going to talk about, when we get to it, there are two different battles of Gog and Magog. They occur at different periods of time. There's the first battle of Gog and Magog, the second battle of Gog and Magog, and you'll be interested to know they relate to Russia attacking Israel. Zechariah chapter 14, I hope you all have read this and gotten excited when you read it. But that's a description of what happens when Christ lands on the Mount of Olives and enters into Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives splits open and he comes in and lots of things are going on at that point. Joel chapter 2, most of you know Joel chapter 2 from Acts 2 where some of the verses out of Joel 2 are quoted on the day of Pentecost. That deals with the day of the Lord in judgment. That is a very key term which the Lord willing will be studying, the day of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24 and 25, in fact, the day of the Lord is mentioned in the opening of the book of Revelation. Matthew chapter 24 and 25, that's what has been called the Olivet Discourse. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ goes out to the Mount of Olives and he sits there and he discusses the end times with his disciples shortly before he is betrayed and goes to the cross. Jeremiah chapter 30 verses 10 through 24. Jeremiah also describes a judgment based on how the Gentiles treat the Jews. Our Lord Jesus Christ talks about that as well. That's a lot of parallel stuff in Matthew 24 and 25 with Jeremiah chapter 30. And then Isaiah chapter 65 and 66 deal with the millennial reign of the Messiah. 
You see, all of these things are dealing with end times events, things that are yet to come. Very important events that are yet to come. Now, I'm going to read just a little bit out of each of, well, at least the first two, because we won't have enough time to read them all. But I want you to, to listen as I read a little bit of Daniel chapter 7. I'm not going to read all of Daniel 7 and 8, just a little bit of Daniel chapter 7. This is the vision of the four world empires. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four wings of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man and the man's heart was given to it. And behold another beast, a second, like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour my flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces, and spread the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn. Before him were there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. I hope that rings some bells with you, because the book of Revelation talks about the Ancient of Days. It talks about one, in fact, in the Son of Man vision in the first chapter, it talks about one whose garment is white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. It talks about his throne. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and judgment was set, and the books were opened. I hope that rings some bells out of the book of Revelation for you. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Very interesting phrase. We find that in the book of Revelation. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like, now you've heard this phrase, I hope, in the New Testament, like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. You discover there are a lot of symbols that are used here in this passage. We find some of them explained in the Gospels. We find some of them explained in the epistles. We find some of them are actually explained in the book of Revelation as it uses them. But we'll be looking at that later. Let me give you a little bit from Psalm 2. This is also specifically quoted in the New Testament in reference to the second coming. Remember, this is written a thousand years before Christ. 
Why do you even rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That is the word Mashiach. Against the Lord and his Messiah, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. <laughs> he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> He's looking at these bunch of little skinny ants down there on earth saying, We're going to fix God. He goes, Oh, yeah, really? The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Now, I hope you remember this from the New Testament. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the most parts of the earth for thy possession. I've seen a lot of mission boards using that verse for going out in missions. That's not a missionary verse. That's taking a text out of context on a pretext. What is the, pre the context here? It's not he's going to give the nations to the missionaries for an inheritance. He's giving the nations to the Son, and it tells you in the next verse what the Son is going to do with the nations. This is not missionary work. Look at verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Always take verses in their context, folks. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. I hope you picked up a few phrases out of Psalm 2. And as you read through the rest of those passages that I gave to you, I hope you say, wow, I've heard that someplace before. I've heard that someplace before. And not just in that text. You'll discover those same things over in the doctrinal epistles, in the Gospels, a couple of times in Acts, and definitely in the book of Revelation. You see, that's the foundation. You have to understand the foundation if you're going to understand the condensed version, so to speak, in the book of Revelation, where it's all packed together in one continuous narrative, picking up all the pieces of the Old Testament, all the pieces in the Gospels, all the pieces in the book of Acts, all the pieces in the doctrinal epistles, and putting it together and saying, here's the way it's going to happen. I'm giving you the order now. Here's the way it's going to happen. That's why we have to go back and look at some of these Old Testament passages. Psalm 110, of course, specifically quoted in the New Testament in reference to the coming of Christ and the defeat of the Antichrist. I'll give you just a little bit of that one. The Lord said unto my Lord, and this, by the way, is quoted by Jesus, to prove that he is, in fact, the Messiah, and he is, in fact, God. Because the word Lord, the first Lord, is all capitals. Look at your Bibles there. The Lord said unto my Lord, it's little L-O-R-D there, as Jehovah said unto Adonai. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make thee thine enemies. But you see in Greek, it's kurios for both of them. The kurios said unto my kurios, and Jesus is quoting it that way. And he says, if David calls the Messiah his Lord, how then is the Messiah David's son? They got the point. It says they could not answer him a word, neither dared any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Because if they answered that question, the only conclusion that they could come to was not only that the Messiah would be the descendant of David, but if the Messiah is David's Lord, spoken of here a thousand years before the Messiah came, he must also be David's God. It's the incarnation of the Messiah, of God himself in the flesh, and they dared not answer that question. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And the word for willing there is free will offerings. In the day of thy armies, in the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning, 
Oh man, that's a fascinating phrase. We're not going to have time for that tonight. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. But that's talking about how the heavens will be totally dark. All the sky will be black. The sun is blotted out. The moon is blotted out. The stars are blotted out. It's utter darkness. And then the sign of the Son of Man appears in the heavens. The Shekinah glory as Christ returns to the earth. And all the world will because of him. They're terrified. It's in the book of Revelation. We'll get there. And we'll go back to this passage here. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's quoted four times in the book of Hebrews, referring to Jesus. The Lord of thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. That's second coming. He shall judge all the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And then he's victorious in verse 7. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. And of course the other passages that I mentioned for a moment ago. Now, there are many other prophecies that the Lord willing will be covering when we go through Revelation, but I think those will give you a start. And I encourage you, read all of those passages that I gave you on that handout sheet. I've given you space to take notes. Make some notes to yourself in those little spaces between each one of the passages that I gave to you. And it will give you a really good head start so that when we go through the book of Revelation and I make reference back to those passages, you'll have your sheet of paper. You'll say, ah, I see it now. I see it now. We can't cover every passage in the Old Testament, but we're going to pick up some big ones, okay? And I think you'll see that what we have in the book of Revelation is real, literal, future history given to us in advance. Now, let me begin our discussion tonight by passing out another chart detailing the four main systems of eschatology. Uh, and each one of them, of course, al also has various subdivisions. So if one of you gentlemen would come up here and uh, take the next one. And this is, fortunately, I didn't have to type this one up. This is actually from uh, the Christian Jew Foundation in San Antonio from Messianic Perspectives. Oh, I'll give you these. I'll this one here. The four major views of prophecy. The first one is called premillennialism, and that's what we are. Uh, that is what in the ancient church was called chiliasm. That is the futurist view. It hasn't yet been fulfilled. As you look at the book of Revelation, that's stuff that is still to come. It anticipates a literal return of Messiah Jesus to establish a literal 1,000-year kingdom with its seat of government in Jerusalem. This view is based largely on a literal interpretation of the promises that God made to Israel through Abraham, David, and others in the Old Testament, regarding those promises as essentially unconditional. Who are the main advocates of that position? Little box over to the right. The apostles advocated that position. The early, that is the first century church fathers and many of the early church fathers after them. The Anabaptists of the Reformation era and later Charles Haddon Spurgeon in the 19th century England. Today its constituency in the US and Canada consists mainly of conservative evangelicals but it's not widely held in Europe. And of course I, my thought is it probably wouldn't be uh, since a lot of Europe is part of the ancient Roman Empire, which will become part of the reestablished Roman Empire uh, under the Antichrist. What are its strengths? The strength of the futurist view is that it's based on the natural and unforced meaning of Old Testament promises. We believe its objective method, as opposed to a looser subjective allegorical approach, is more conducive to the accurate, contextualized interpretation of the prophetic text. Now, most Reformed people fall into the next three camps, especially those who are liberals and who do not want to believe that Jesus is coming back. The first is amillennialism, and by far that is probably the largest group. They allegorize the view of the book of Revelation. They typically dismiss the idea of a literal kingdom as a carnal myth based on primitive Jewish notions and a misplaced emphasis on the Abrahamic and Davidic promises. They say ethnic Israel is no longer relevant. They say the kingdom is symbolic and exists now in the church. Remember I talked about the difference between Israel and the church. And they say the promise God made formerly to Israel now belong to the church. 
its main advocates. After starting out as a chiliastic millenarian in the City of God, chapter 20, verse 7, Augustine, who was about 400, changed his mind and became the first major proponent of the amillennial view. Calvin later embraced it, as did others, and today it is dominant view in Christendom. So most of the people who are out there don't believe that Jesus is literally coming back to establish his kingdom. Ah is the negative millennium, so no millennium. When you view the Bible through a symbolic rather than a literal historical grid, you can make it say almost anything. This approach tends to create a disconnect between a prophetic text and its intended meaning. Also, quote, the wedding of pagan philosophy to Christian theology has never created a fruitful union, unquote. The third view is called postmillennialism, the historicist, the panoramic history view of the book of Revelation. It says that the Messiah will return after the church succeeds in transforming the world into an earthly kingdom. So it says our quest should be to Christianize the world so that the Lord can return. That's the idea of bringing in the kingdom. Christ can't return until you do something about it and you Christianize the world. Now, that was very popular up until World War I. After World War I, there were very few proponents of it. Lorraine Bettner was one, for example, and he's written a number of very influential books. <clears throat> but that, um, that's the idea that the world is getting better and better and better and better, and eventually it will get good enough for Jesus to come back. That's post-millennial. Uh, that the last thousand years will be a perfect thousand years and he'll come back after the millennium. Proponents have included Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, and most of the reformers, other than the Anabaptists. Many 19th and early 20th century Bible believers, like the Southern Baptist B.H. Carroll, were post-millennialists. And then this view rapidly lost favor in the 20th century after two world wars, but has resurged in recent decades in modified forms, like those found in Reconstructionists. I hope some of you have heard that term. term that's like um, uh, Roussas, uh, John Rush Dooney. Uh, he was very popular back in the 60s and 70s. I think he's with the Lord now, but he wrote a lot of stuff. Re he, he's the grandfather of Reconstructionism and the Dominionist movements. He was also the father of the Dominionist movement. And then there's Preterism, which seems to be really the one on the rise today. The Preterist says that the book of Revelation is all past history. It insists that the second coming prophecies were largely fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Uh, consistent or full preterists also reject future resurrections and judgments. Now that, folks, gets serious. Rejects all future resurrections and all future judgments. Where did it come from? And it's amazing that some of the people that follow it follow it because listen, listen to its birth. Many preterists recognize that their system was developed by a Spanish Jesuit named Alcazar in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and it has had adherence in Roman Catholicism since that time. More recently, some Protestants, like R.C. Sproul, by the way, he was one of my teachers at Gordon College, and he and I used to go out at hammer and tongs fighting over these issues, have adopted it in a modified form known as partial preterism. Well, let's evaluate it. Preterists regard Matthew 24, remember that's the upper room, uh, that, that, that's the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation as past history with little or no relevance to our present or future. Many Bible believers consider consistent or full preterism a heresy due to the extreme difficulty in reconciling its tenets with scriptures like, and I'm going to let you look these up and read them for yourself so you can check it out, you know, test the doctrines by scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> so if you get confused when we're going through this, you can look back at this chart and that'll help you understand what we're talking about and I hope you will do so. Now, I want to go over a, a simplified chart to show where we are in the course of history as it relates to fulfilled biblical prophecy or biblical prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. So if I could have someone come up here again and we're starting to run out of time so we'll just spend a few minutes on this because I don't want to rush through this. I want everybody to understand it, but I'll at least go over it, and you can read it this week. <clears throat> Again, this is not original. 
this comes from Messianic Perspectives. And uh, the times of the Gentiles and its eschaton, that is its termination, its end, like in eschatology, the doctrine of last things. You see the big dark you know, triangle over on the left, and it's a timeline that's going from left to right. <coughs> And you can't read it inside that because the photocopier wouldn't pick up the words. So I've written them up above, the times of the Gentiles. And by the way, all these verses that I've written in on here, be sure to look those up so that you'll know what we're talking about when we refer, for example, to the times of the Gentiles. We are currently living in the times of the Gentiles. Then down underneath, you'll see I've handwritten in because you can't read it. The triangle is so dark. That's the Arab-Israeli wars that are going on. And the scripture has some things to say about that. It talks about the nations surrounding Israel and what they're going to be doing. And we see the nations aligning in exactly the way that the Bible says that they would align. And uh, the Arab conflicts that have been going on. And then you find where that comes down to a little point, that's the snatching away of the church, or we call it the rapture. And underneath you see there's a three and a half year period. Then you find some middle arrows and then another three and a half year period. That deals with the seven years of the Great Tribulation, which is divided into three halves, and that's very important when we get into the book of Revelation, because the first seven judgments, which are called the seal judgments, and I'm going to be going over an outline of the whole book of Revelation before we do it in detail, but the first seven judgments take us to the midpoint of the Tribulation, or the Great Tribulation. When seal number seven is opened, the next seven judgments proceed out of it, which are the trumpet judgments. That takes you almost through the three and a half years of the second half of the Great Tribulation. When the last trumpet sounds, it opens the seven bowl, B-O-W-L, or vial, V-I-A-L, not V-I-L-E, the seven bowl judgments, which occur during the last week of the tribulation. And all of the judgments, starting at the beginning, each one gets more severe than the judgments before it. Because God is telling the earth, I'm giving you opportunity to repent, just like he did with Pharaoh. The judgments started off fairly mild, but they ended with the death of the firstborn. They got more and more and more and more and more severe to force Pharaoh to repent. But as I said this morning, when we get to Revelation chapter 16, which is the bold judgments, no matter how severe, men still turn and curse God and refuse to repent of their evil. But that at least will give you, shows you the two halves of the um, three and a half years. We find the wars that are spoken about in the book of Daniel. We find the first battle of Gog and Magog. We find the second coming, which is different from the snatching away, the rapture of the church, where Jesus is not just coming to us in the air and picking us up and taking us back to heaven. This doesn't show yet. I'll give you a more complete chart later on where it shows the wedding feast of the Lamb going on in heaven during the time of the great tribulation on earth. We're having a wonderful banquet while the people on earth who've rejected Jesus and continue to reject Jesus are having a horrible time. God's giving us blessings. And then at the end of that is when we come back at the second coming with Christ. That's Revelation chapter 19. Then you have the messianic age, the millennium of a thousand years, and then you have the second battle of Gog and Magog at the end of that time. Now the first battle of Gog and Magog is described for you in Ezekiel uh, 37, 38, 39, you have a bunch of things going on there that tie together. And um, the second battle of Gog and Magog is when God comes down and destroys everybody that's rejected him and sets up the great white throne judgment. But we'll talk about that later. Now, down below, and our time is up, but you will see the different battles and conflicts that are listed over on the left. You'll find the prophetic texts where you can see them being described for you, then you will find who participates in it and the location of where each one is going to take place, which is described in those scripture passages that you have. You'll see what starts them and what ends them. And so I'm going to let you read those this week because um, it will give you a whole lot better understanding 
of what's happening as we go through the book of Revelation. So I don't often pass out this kind of stuff tonight. Everybody who showed up got goodies. People who weren't here didn't get the goodies. You got the goodies. So you've got a head start on everybody else. And the Lord willing, we'll continue there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Indeed, you have given us detailed information, not just sort of general, well, something bad's going to happen someday to the earth, and you hope you're not here if uh, it happens, you know. You've given us real details. And every time you give details, every detail occurs. It comes to pass. You don't generalize. You want us to know that you are the God who not only knows, but who controls the end from the beginning. It comes to pass because your word is true and you will not have your word fall to the ground. Help us, Father, to gain a deeper insight, deeper understanding, a deeper love, a deeper respect for the precision and the nature of Scripture as we go through this study so that Jesus Christ, the one who is the living word, we might honor him. No flaws in the written word, no flaws, no sin in the living word, the one who is our Savior. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together tonight. We pray for your blessings upon it and deeper understanding, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our closing hymn tonight, another one of the hymns that is wonderful to think about our Lord's return. Number 759, What If It Were Today? Seven hundred.